There's a pretty one, Ulysses. Hello Booktube, I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel and another Friday Reads. Here I am uh, quite a bit later in the day than I usually start, but I got nothing else to do today except this and I don't have a whole lot to say. So I decided to go down for a morning nap, which kind of extended into the early afternoon before I got started here. So good afternoon, everybody. I have had a great reading week. So I do have things I'm excited to talk about, but I don't have a lot of things to tell you about. And the highlight of my week, and really the only thing I have to tell you that isn't of a bookish nature, is Mom and I went to see Wonka a couple days ago. And I loved it. I, I thought I would love it. Um, I would have been crushed if I hadn't loved it. I did adore it. Um, not only because Timothy Chalamet's in it, I, I had a complicated relationship with the original 1971 uh, movie Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, or is it? Is that the name of the that movie? It scared me. I was six years old, and it scared me. So, <laughs> in the last couple of weeks, Mum and Dad and I have w rented those two videos on YouTube. So we watched, by mistake, we watched the uh, rather awful remake with Johnny Depp, who I usually love, but I thought he was just abysmal in that role, whenever that was in the '90s, and whatever that movie was called. But I rented it by mistake. I thought I was renting the 1971 and I got that one. So we watched that one first and then just last Sunday night or something like that, we watched the original one, enjoyed it. And then this was just, uh, I'm not going to spend very much time talking about this movie. I'm going to spend, the t what time I'm going to spend is going to be about Timothy Chalamet, not about the movie. But this is a prequel type thing. It's not the same, covering the same ground. It's an early life story of Willy Wonka and Timothy Chalamet, who has never had a musical role in a film, did go to a drama school where he studied that in his family. There's lots of musical and dance people in his immediate family, but this was uh, quite a stretch for him, and I thought he did very well, and he was adorable, and so was so many of the actors. I loved it with all my heart, and Timothy Chalamet is the bee's knees. Enough said. Without further ado, I have a Yet another really exciting mystery guest this week. This week's mystery guest is the novelist Christopher Dorado, joining us from Montreal. And Christopher is the author of two really great novels, The Geography of Pluto, which I read and reviewed earlier this year uh, with some Canada geese as backup. And <laughs> I'm currently reading his second novel, The Family Way, and absolutely loving it. Christopher and I are going to have a long-form chat about his writing later on, but for today, he's my mystery guest to talk about what he's reading, writing, and all that good stuff. Christopher, what an honor to have you on my channel. Oh, thank you, Sean. Thank you. Uh, it's an honor to be invited. I, I love talking about uh, books and literature, my own, other people's books as well, so this is a treat. So, um, should we start with yours or other people's? Let's start with you. Um, uh, anything you'd care to share about something you're working on or what might be coming out next or anything like that? Yeah, you know, it's an interesting question. Um, my first book, Geography of Pluto, took 14 years to write. Family Way took seven. So I'm really hoping the third one's going to take, like, I seem to be kind of cutting it in half there. So, you know, three and a half. Uh, so I don't know. Uh, hopefully I can I can get the next book out in a couple of years or so. Yeah, about 100,000 words into uh, a next project. But a lot of people ask me what it's about, and and I'm I'm I am kind of hesitant sometimes to say too much about it because I don't really know what's it about yet. Like sometimes it, that kind of comes together at some point in the process as you're writing it. Um, you know, you're bringing in all these influences. You got characters, and they're doing something, and then you know I don't want to go on record as saying it's about something, and then find out oh no, it's completely about something else. Suffice it to say, it's a family drama set in the suburbs of Montreal in a small town called Saint Hubert, Quebec, where I grew up. And it's about um, an Italian-Canadian family uh, in the late 1980s. So we'll leave it at that for the moment. I'm fully into it. I'm fully ensconced up to up to here, almost up to here with it right now, really, to be honest with you. Uh, but, uh, you know, that, the, the challenges I'm having at the moment are fun challenges, at least uh, for me at the moment. That sounds really exciting. And uh, I, I knew we would be talking about inversion in some way or other in this conversation. But now I get to talk about it. Is, it geometri is that geometry or mathematics? You said the <laughs> first book uh, was seven, uh, 14, 14 years to write. Mm -hmm. And it's 212 pages. And the second one took you 
seven years uh, to write. Seven, that's right. And it's 418. So the next one's going to take you half and be 800 pages. Oh, it's actually, yeah, you know what? It's weird. I, I, I'm i a little worried that it might be close to 600. And it's one of those things that, you know, you try not to think too much about the marketability of books, at least, you know, when I, I try to at least, but, you know, with the cost of paper and all that stuff, sometimes I do worry. I wonder, you know, do, do certain books become unattractive to publishers because they're too long? Uh, but, you know, at this point, I'm taking the time that it takes and we can always try to cut back and edit edit later. But I'm kind of a writer that prefers to overwrite uh, rather than kind of, you know, the other way around. Well, I can speak uh, as somebody who loves your work already that I, I 800 page novel, no problem at all. That's great to hear. Good. Thank you. So what have you been reading these days, Christopher? So uh, you might know this, but maybe your uh, viewers do not. I run a book club in Montreal. Uh, it's called the Violet Hour Book Club. It just turned five in December, uh, sorry, November. And I started it as a companion to my reading series. For about 10 years, I have something called the Violet Hour, which is an LGBTQ reading series and interview series that's been happening since uh, 2014 in Montreal. And then about five years ago, I wanted an opportunity to kind of bring the public in more, you know, usually with like readings, you know, an author's on stage, they'll read from their work, maybe they'll answer one or two questions from the audience. But I wanted there to be something a little bit more for the for the audience. So book readers, back in the day in 2018, we didn't have an LGBTQ bookstore in Montreal. So if you wanted to find out LGBTQ books, uh, it, it was a little bit more difficult. And I can remember myself when I was like a, a young gay man first coming out and, and also a young writer, emerging writer, trying to figure out, you know, who are my, who am I going to be looking to towards, you know, the kind of authors that I, I want to model myself after. It was the gay bookstore was the place where I learned all of that. And that was through other people and talking about books and sharing recommendations. And so, so my book club became kind of a natural extension of that, like of just wanting to be able to have that space again. You know, maybe we didn't maybe we didn't have a physical LGBTQ bookstore in Montreal at that time. We do now, by the way. We have it. We have we we have a new one called Le, Le Guillon, which is a feminist and LGBTQ bookstore that came came up at least in the last five years. I can't remember when, but back then, I I just wanted to bring people together because I know I know that for me it was really important. And so you know, in the last five years, we've read sixty books together, uh, and it's a monthly wow. book club, so anyone can join, provided they well. I mean, it's in Montreal, but we also have a Zoom component, uh, you know, during okay. the pandemic, during the pandemic, you know, we couldn't meet in person. So we switched to Zoom and uh, and we've kept it because, you know, we, we ended up bringing on some some people who, you know, we have one person who joins us all the time from New Brunswick. You know, we've had people join from the States, people who are not feeling well and are not, you know, maybe not well feeling well that they want to kind of actually be in a room with other people still. And so they're able to join. So so we've got this hybrid book club going and that's you know that's been driving a lot of my reading habits i would say for the last little while it is open to people online if they want to join i have a website so uh christopherdorado.com there's also a, a facebook group violet hour book club and anyone can join okay. and then you know the thing a great thing about it too is that you don't have to come to all of them you don't have to say that you're coming uh, you don't even have to read uh, the whole book. You know, some people actually just like to co to come and hear other people speak about the books that they That's read. Right. You know, and so anyone is welcome to join. I actually just the other day, uh, I'm trying to be an organized person because I'm juggling a lot of hats all the time. I had to write down all of the books that I have to read. Uh, you know, want to read too, but really have to read for the next like, you know, four months. And I, I calculated uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There's eleven books that I really must read between now and the end of uh, of April. And so I've got like you know this like piece of paper here with their name, the date it needs to be read by. So uh, I need to be. I'm sure like you must be like that as well. You've got to be focused on a certain number of books because of your podcast, right? You need to have a certain things read by a certain time. Is that correct? It, well, it is in the sense that I do a lot of buddy reads, and so those are on a fairly schedule so i can't keep track of those and then on booktube there's a lot of uh, themed reading months or readathons and so there's this kind of a schedule for that too but it's fairly loosey-goosey but yes i have a reading calendar every year yeah 
Yeah. yeah I mean, it's exciting. It's, you know, I have to say I'm kind of, it's a lot uh, for sure for me. Um, you know, I try to read about 25 books a year. And uh, I think this is probably like half of the number that I would normally read within a four month period. So I'm going to be very, but this is great. It's actually, you know, being part of a book club and leading a book club actually forces me to read more, um, you know, uh, maybe force sound force sounds bad, but like, um, I get lazy, you know, I, I, you know, get taken out of things with like things all the time. But, but the thing I love about this is it's really up my ante in terms of being able to read more books a year. And I, I want that to kind of continue. Yeah. So I can talk about one of the books that, you know, this was our December title. Uh, we read uh, Michael Tolliver Lives by Armistead Maupin. As you may know, Armistead Maupin famously wrote the Tales of the City series, which started out as a serialized started out serialized in the newspaper the san francisco chronicle uh in the 1970s and you know he was one of the first people uh you know writing about a chosen family i would say you know like kind of people kind of coming together leaving their families of origin their biological families and kind of finding community finding family uh and in this case in san francisco why we chose this one to read in the book club and not the first one Michael Tolliver Lives is the only book that he's written in the series that is told by a first person perspective. Oh. So the other books are, you know, third person. He's got like this cast of characters of people in San Francisco. But Michael Tolliver, for many, especially for me, would, would be like, you know, he was the gay male character. He was the one looking for love in San Francisco. He was the one at odds with his family uh, who uh, were conservative and, and living in Florida. And so... Armistead Maupin wrote this book 18 years after the Tales of the City, you know, the last Tales okay. of the City book. So there's a huge gap between. And he decided that he wanted to revisit his character, Michael Mouse uh, Tolliver. And so the book opens, Michael Tolliver is now 55 and he's he's survived the, you know, the AIDS epidemic. You know, I think a lot of people might have might have assumed that someone like Michael Tolliver Mouse living in San Francisco at that time might not have gotten through it. So, you know, what Armistead Maupin does here in this book is basically show us what Michael Michael's life is like now at 55 and I can't remember the year it's set, but it's the early 2000s, I believe. And mm -hmm. he's in a relationship, you know, he's dealing still with his conservative mother and his conservative brother. Um, but, you know, he's found he's found love and it's with a younger man. And so, you know, we don't often get to see... Um, what queer life is like in our 50s, right, in, in literature. And so I, I I really did appreciate this book. Sounds like a book that I'm at the right stage of life to read myself. <laughs> yeah, and as I mentioned, he talks a lot about chosen family. And like when we do talk about the family way, it's interesting, while reading this book, I, I never realized how much this book influenced uh, my own writing. So um, that that's something that by the rereading of this book made me realize, wow, you know, yeah, I mean, Armistead definitely has been kind of a father figure, I think, even in terms for me, for, for my writing. So, so that's one. The next book, uh, just, just began it. Um, it's called The Philistine by Leila Marshi. Uh, Leila Marshi is a Montreal writer. So it's, she is someone that I know I've known for, for quite a while. Those of you who don't know Montreal very well, I should say we have a really vibrant literary community here in Montreal. Uh, a vibrant French language writing community, but also an English language writing community. And a lot of us English language writers know, support each other's work. And there's quite a few queers here too. So, you know, Layla, yes. Layla is one of them. Um, okay. You know, she, she is of uh, Canadian, uh, well, actually Newfoundland Palestinian heritage. So oh, kind of like joint heritage. What a fascinating there. mix. Oh my goodness. We don't hear a lot of, uh, of, of stories of that kind of mix. And, and, and even like, queer Palestinian uh, uh, perspectives. We don't he hear a lot of them, right? And and I, I, I did see ch cho try I did chose this book because, you know, of what's happening in the world right now, I think it was important to kind of listen to voices from, um, you know, who, from that part of the world. And, and, you know, even though, like I said, Leela does live here, she has a lot of lived experience. And so um, this book is about a Canadian Palestinian woman, a young woman who decides kind of on a whim to go visit her father in Cairo. So she lives with her mom in Canada and Montreal, cold, cold Montreal. And uh, she hasn't been back to visit her dad in a long time. And her dad is a Palestinian man living in Cairo. And so she decides to show up and surprise him there. So she takes a flight, books a flight and goes there and then finds out a lot of stuff about her family and also about herself while she's on, on vacation there. And I think I'm just going to leave it at that. You know, it's kind of yeah. coming of age. 
you know, deals a lot with kind of queerness and like discovering one's sexuality and set in a part of the world, Cairo, you know, that I don't know very much about. And so I've been really enjoying learning a bit about that, especially also queer life um, in, in Cairo. Sounds fascinating. Then the other one, I'm not sure if your your viewers will go out and, and buy this one, but when you're writing a book, you do a lot of research. You you also do a lot of stuff that kind of puts you in the the world that you're writing. You know, for me, music is a big part of how I write. But for the first time, I'm writing a book that's not set at a time that I know of. You know, both books, Geography Pluto and Family Way are contemporary novels, right? But the one that I'm writing right now, I, I like I mentioned happens in the 1980s, but it also uh, it covers a bigger era. It goes back to the 60s in Montreal, it goes back to the 70s in Montreal, and it it deals with a part of Montreal that, like I said, I didn't really kind of experience and I don't know very much about. So I decided to read, I found this book, okay? It's called Community and the Human Spirit, Oral Histories from Montreal's Point St. Charles, Griffintown, and Goose Village. And the author's name, Dave Flavel. So it's a book of oral history, kind of, when I say oral history, like, you know, he interviewed a lot of the people who grew up in these Montreal neighborhoods about their lives. So these are people who were born in the 30s, they were born in the 40s, and they lived in these neighborhoods in Montreal where I, where my characters are from. Uh, these neighborhoods were very tough neighborhoods, a lot of poverty, there was a bit of violence, but they were also loving, um, you know, they, a lot of them were, were, were born into kind of loving homes. Uh, my dad actually kind of grew up in Goose Village. So a okay. part of... A part of me has always been very much interested in this. You know, my dad had given me his stories, but I wanted to know how they kind of lined up with a lot of other people who like lived during that time. So I've been kind of like eating this up like it's like sugar. Like it's just, you know, every chapter is like, you know, maybe like eight to 10, 12, 15 pages. You know, there's there's some photos also. And it's all kind of basically written up the way someone would kind of speak to you and kind of share share with you a bit about like, you know, I grew up in this. My mother was from yeah. from this this town. My dad was from this town. I went to this school and kind of pull it all together. It's it's just really wonderful. It's just really kind of unearthing a part of Montreal's history that I didn't know that much about. And I'm really excited to see in which the ways that like these people's lives are kind of informing the characters' lives in my book. And then the last book that I will, and you, you've probably heard this one in your viewers as well, is of course like The Secret History by yes. Donna Tartt. This is a book that I've had on my shelf for like, I would say probably 20 years, I don't know, 20 years maybe, that I've never gotten to. And, you know, Dude. it's one of these books that everyone talks about, right? Like it's their favorite yeah. book. I read The Goldfinch and adored The Goldfinch. Like okay. that, that one was probably one of my f favorite reading experiences uh, of, of recent memory. You know, again, when you talk about big books, that is a big book. I read it in no time. And so I, I knew that I would get to this one day. So I, I got tired of really staring it out on my bookshelf and I'm like, no, I'm picking it up. Um, I should say it's not part of the 12 on this list. So we'll see how far I get into it. But I'm about like 240 pages into it already, but like maybe like almost a halfway through. And I'm really enjoying it so far. I, I'm a really big fan of Donna Turner. I really love that. Like she she's so smart, like reading it. I just I can only imagine the type of research she had to do, you know, for the Goldfinch. So much of it was art history. And this, there's so much about like the Greek language and kind of right. like classics that someone's intellect to be able to kind of write this stuff to make it also sound like they know what they're talking about is, you know, mind blowing to me. So, um, so He's just written those two, right? I think there's no, a, well, no, there's a third one that I, third, yeah, the little friend who's in the middle, but they're they come out about once a decade, so we should be due for another one. Fingers crossed. Yes. Fingers crossed. That might take me a while to get to too. Who knows? But yeah, that's the great thing about books, right? Like, you know, they can come out and they don't go bad. You can, uh, you know, you don't can go take bad. your time with them. <laughs> Based on what you've talked about just now, Christopher, it strikes me that you're more of a backlist reader than new releases. Would that be accurate? I think so. I think that's, a. you know, I, I'm one of these readers who I don't like hardcovers very much. And, oh. um, and it's, it's interesting. Like I almost feel like there's a classist thing when it comes to hardcovers because a writer like me, who's like you know with independent press, my books will never become hardcovers, and that's fine. But hardcovers also come out at a very expensive price too, so not everyone, pe you know, not everyone can have access to it right away. So for me, like I will see a book that I, you know, that comes out that I'm really interested in, and I'll I'll make note of it. But it's rare that I'll buy it right away, unless it's like something that I feel like you know. Um, 
I just have to have it like now. I need to be part of the conversation now. But right. you're you're completely right, especially with the book club as well. Like I, I feel sometimes we forget books. Books will come out. They might pass in front of us, but then, you know, we get distracted by the next new shiny thing. And then, you know, some of these works end up disappearing. And so, with, especially with the book club, by picking, you know, classics. And, and by classics, I mean, you know, we can look back at like Armistead Maupin's book here, which came out in 2007. Or even like Layla's, who came out probably in, was it 2018, I believe her book came out? But it's so prescient now. Like, you know, like she's talking about an experience that like a lot of people are only kind of like thinking about now. And so this is a book that, you know, might disappear. You know, like we get a lot of buzz, right? Like you get interviews, you get like reviews and stuff like that. And then maybe people forget about it. So I, I really do believe that the more that I can uplift backlist titles, I think I can, you know, I, I'm extremely happy to do so. Uh, that certainly resonates for me. I read, uh, I would say at least 50%, maybe probably more like 60 or 70% backlist. And the more obscure the book, the more I likely am to pick it up. Yeah, I still am attracted to shiny new new books as well. But yeah, it's, I'm, I tend to specialize in, in the ones that and are do, off the Do you track. buy it when it came out and keep it in your library and then re re write it? Of course I do. Or... Of course I do. <laughs> yes, it's ridiculous. <laughs> Of what that, I think that's going to be a New Year's resolution, actually. Get them as wherever possible. Get them from the library and then only buy them if I love them. Mm -hmm. That's that's we'll see how, how, how far I get with this. Now, these are no ordinary soft cover books, these are just gorgeous specimens of French flaps. Yes, they're they very just beautiful. feel so great in your hands, both of them. And uh, so, th these to me are as precious as a hardcover. I do tend to always buy the hardcover but these are these are gorgeous who are some of your favorite queer authors well that's a good Besides question christopher so, dorado yeah <laughs> <laughs> um andrew holleran uh is probably i don't know if there's another writer that's made more of an impact on my life than him dancer from the dance was a book that transformed my writing and even my view of myself as an author I always knew that I wanted to be a writer, but I didn't know what kind of writer. I didn't know what kind of story I had to say. And when I even look back on my youth, I was trying to be Stephen King. You know, I wasn't a, necessarily a Stephen King fan, but I just knew that he was a writer and he wrote mysteries. So I'm going to write a mystery. I'm going to write a horror story. And I wasn't even a fan of horror. It was just because I didn't know what my story was. I didn't know what I, what I had to say. And when I read Dancer from the Dance... That to me, like, you know, although the book was written in, I think it was the late 60s, I think it was published, I felt like he was writing about me and my life and my feelings. And, you know, and even though these characters are kind of vapid and going from party to party to party, that was what my 20s was like. And I really felt that I enjoyed spending time in the world that he was creating. And so he definitely is one of them. And then... I'm going to mention two others, if that's okay. Yeah. So yes. then another one is Ethan Morden, and he oh, is an yes. American writer. Uh, he hasn't mm. written something in a, in a long... I know that he writes a lot of ac academic books about, I think, opera, um, yes, but he, he he's he's written a number of books about gay life in the in the U.S. and... Buddies uh, and... Buddies and uh, the feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. And a really big tome as well, the most recent one yes. that I ever heard about. Yeah. There was how long has this been going on? Is the it was the big tome? Was that it? Yeah, and that one show basically told the story of queer liberation in the states, uh, beginning in the 1930s to 1994, and it really kind of covers. It follows a bunch of disparate storylines, people living in different uh, American towns, all kind of coming out, coming of age, and then it kind of culminates on Gay Pride Day in New York in 1994. And it's just, I remember just reading that book and also being just like gobsmacked. I think I do like big books. I think, you know, I want to spend more time with these people and uh, and I, I haven't read it in a number of years and, you know, it, it's out of print, you know, and, and the moment it goes back into print, it's going to be on my syllabus for, you know, the book club. And then the third one, yeah, these are big books. Um, it The third writer would be Sarah Waters and she is a British novelist who writes a lot of Victorian era lesbian fiction, historical fiction. Fingersmith. Fingersmith, Tipping the Velvet, uh, The Night Watch. I think The Night Watch is my favorite of hers. Loved Fingersmith. She is the hardcover. I will buy her in hardcover the moment it comes out. I'm not interested in writing historical fiction, but like I just, I love her sentences. Her sentences are so beautiful. 
And again, she creates these wonderful scenarios, surprising scenarios. She is also due for another book. I am waiting with bated breath, whatever that happens. Sometimes she's not, there's not many authors like that, but I will Google, you know, Sarah Waters, new book, yes. Sarah Waters, 2024, just to see like, is it coming? Just give me it. Can you give me like a little like breadcrumbs? She would probably be my third choice. Yeah. Well, oh my goodness. I have a feeling you and I could talk about queer lit for hours and hours and hours, but this is a wonderful um, a taste of all the things going on in your very gay, very literary world. And I'm so excited about your writing. I think you're a tremendous writer um, and uh, can't wait to talk to you more about your own writing uh, early next year. Me too. I can't wait for that too. You're a great host. I uh, love talking books and uh, your questions are great. So thank you so much, Sean. Isn't he just the sweetest guy, Christopher Dorado? He just has the loveliest gay voice. And, uh, you know, as speaking as a gay man, that's a that's high praise for me. I, I could just listen to him talk all day. <laughs> and I'm uh, really enjoying his second novel, The Family Way. And uh, like as I said there, once I finish it, he and I are going to have a long chat about it and his debut novel, The Geography of Pluto. And here is the Week in Review. I think that's the thing, too, is that uh, Florida, by its very nature, is something that is so bizarre. It's bizarre both politically and in its nature. Lauren Groff talks a lot about this in her work. The people who are coming out of here aren't writing queer characters in a way that feels um, explicit to the ideas we have around what queer, queer experience is. It's, it's, it's a truer experience of queerness. I thought it might be fun to take that perspective to see if you and I could kind of sketch out the voice, the the worldview, the the vision of of a, of our one of some of our favorite writers, for mm -hmm. example. Joyce Carol Oates, how would you describe her vision or her voice? <laughs> and I'm I'm putting a 17 minute time limit on your answer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how long do you want me to go on? <laughs> Here is a Japanese mayonnaise called Koopy Mayonnaise, and there you see the Koopy doll on the on the cover. Not the cover, I'm so used to talking about books. You know what I mean. On the front. And uh, you can get it in Canada. It's expensive. This cost me like seven or eight bucks, but it's so superior to anything you could possibly get in North America that I, I use it when I can afford it. So I hadn't even opened this one yet. So there it is, and I actually have a Koopy doll. There it is. All right. So I finished three books, and in order to finish them, I didn't get far enough into any of the new books that I've started in the last couple of weeks to check in on them. So my check-in from the rest of this video will be me wrapping up th those three books and telling you about the one book I'm going to start this week, which will be the last book I start in, I'm pretty sure, in 2023. This is a bare hardback library book, so I'll just put, hold it up for a second and put up the GIF. I finally finished... The Japanese novel Grass for My Pillow by Saichi Maruya, translated from the Japanese by Dennis Keene. It was originally published in 1966. Translation, 2002. I think I might have started this for the War on Booktube readathon, because it's, it's about a draft dodger in the Pacific War era, the World War II era in Japan. And so I think that's the TBR. I start things b because of readathons, and then by the time I finish them, many months later, I can't remember what readathon. I, I don't think I started this as early as the Asian readathon. I loved it. It's one of the best Japanese novels I've read. The protagonist in the in the mid '60s is a high-level university administrator, and he is dealing with some rumblings happening in his work environment, both amongst people that are his peers, but also higher-ups, because he was a draft dodger, a, a resistor, and he was on the, on the run and just spent the war years hiding from the authorities because he refused to fight. And so the flashbacks are to that time and he, where he was under an assumed identity and just so, had so many difficult experiences. This was an incredibly nuanced study of the consciousness that he possesses in the mid-60s, but also that he developed in the 40s, and how he was shaped by this experience that he doesn't broadcast it, but he did tell the superiors when he was hired, maybe in the 50s at this university, that he had uh, had been a draft resistor. So 
a lot of people, most people in university know about it, but it's never talked about in public. But as the politics of Japan starts change in the 60s, where there's a anti-Vietnam war, the young university age crowd are getting all worked up about the uh, the war in Vietnam, which Japan didn't participate in. But there was all kinds of fermentation there on the political left. His wartime experience of dodging, or I keep using dodging, uh, uh, resisting the draft, it's becoming more problematic. And so he's dealing with uh, office politics, university administrative politics that is threatening his position there. And so those two timelines are both really fascinating. And it was just incredibly rich with his, with detail, uh, some of which I knew, but most of which I didn't know. And I found it profound both on the psychological level in terms of his character and the characters of other people in the story, but also politically, social politically nuanced and just gave me a whole lot to think about, including how much he changes as he gets into middle age. And it's not like he wants to renounce it, but he's he realizes, and this is not a spoiler, I don't think, but he realizes that he has changed in a way that's kind of natural for many of us as we get into middle age. I vaguely remember what it was like getting into middle age. <laughs> it's a long time ago now. <laughs> um, and so there was stuff that I could also relate to. If my description of it sounds good, I do recommend it. It's out of print, I think, but it's in some libraries. I found it at the university library and I, pr I probably want to get my own copy. Highly, highly recommend it. And this was just outstanding. This is my old prof, David Carpenter, his essay, his one essay collection, Writing Home. And I'm doing a series of interviews with him. So the next one that I tape will be about this collection. But I'm going to space them out so that, uh, you know, that you look forward to them. They're not going to come out once a week. I've already got another one taped, which will go out maybe later in January. And so this one might go out later in February or even March to space them out throughout the year, but I'm taping them because right now David Carpenter is not as crazy busy as he often is. So I'm looking forward to chatting with him about this. This is the best essay collection I've ever read. Now I have a very subjective connection to David Carpenter and to uh, the themes of a lot of these essays in a very similar way to how deeply I connected with his memoir, Courting Saskatchewan. And that's the interview that will be going up on my channel next, I think later in January. So much of this was about Saskatoon, Western Canada, its literature, and making a home here, and making a home in the literature from here, that this was just as viscerally compelling as nonfiction can be for me. I was moved by it, I was stimulated by it, I've already signed books out of the library that are in the bibliographies of various of these essays, I can't wait to talk to David Carpenter. And that's all I'll say for now. If you're not from this neck of the woods, I don't know what it would be like to read this, but I found it a heartful, mind-stretching joy to read. And the third one I finished this morning, Selected sh Short Stories of Liam O'Flaherty by Liam O'Flaherty, an Irish writer. This was originally published in 1937. This abridged issue is from June 1970. I really enjoyed it. I, it wasn't a five-star read, but it was certainly a solid four-star read. The stories were a bit samey, and I probably wouldn't have felt that way if I hadn't read most of them in, in a week. They're really solid. Evocative prose, more than beautiful prose. Precisely descriptive of a lot of conflictual situations, both between animals, between animals and humans, and between humans themselves. I don't think I have much to say about them. Liam O'Flaherty died in uh, 1984, but he basically stopped writing. Late 1930s, there was a couple books after that, but he was very political. He was a founding member of the Communist Party of Ireland in 1921. I suppose there would be a social political gloss on many of these stories. That didn't come across in a bad way. In other words, character development and this, uh, the literary quality of the stories was not sacrificed to make a political point. I didn't read them as social. I read them more as just... And, and another reason I didn't quite give it five stars is really on-the-nose stories that were very simple, many of them about animals, including cows. And the second story, The Cow's Death, 
is one of my favorites. And I mean, it's almost more like an anecdote, but it's so so powerfully written. A cow gives birth to a stillborn calf, and the mother cow is just beside herself with emotions that I suppose one could say that is, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Not anachronistic. Um, I suppose certain readers would uh, find it anthrop uh, overly anthropomorphic. I didn't. That the, the mother cow, after the her baby is calf is born dead, her, her grief makes her... She, she watches the, the ranchers throw the dead calf over the edge of the rock into the sea and she she jumps to her death it's really it was really quite moving and there's a lot of stories like that predators and their prey both in the animal kingdom and then hunting and fishing and like i say a few where it's just people that that were really good too i recommend it i didn't love it but i'm really glad i read it i had never heard of him when i pulled this book off the shelf and that's one of my one of the things I love the most about my reading life is that I've, I'm always attracted to the writers I've never heard of or the book spines that, where I've never heard the title of the author. This was a hit for me, but it wasn't a huge hit. All right, so now here is the book I'm going to, and I know I'm not going to, I would be shocked if I finished this book by the end of the year, which is how many days have we got left? Eight or nine days left this year. So I, I'm not expecting to finish it, but this I think will be the last book that I start this year. And that is a book that was on... Well, let me get a little bit political for one moment. I am no longer going to refer to the prestigious literary prize that Lindy and I used to have always talked about um, when their long list is announced, but I'm banning mention of that prize on my channel because that prize is sponsored by a bank, Scotiabank, which is the world's biggest investor in an Israeli military weapon uh, weapons manufacturer. And so um, f f I'm not going to change the world by my little ban here, but I'm not going to mention that prize by name until they get their head out of their ass and get a different sponsor. Until then, that prize is dead to me. However, it was on that prize's long list, this novel, The Clarion, by Nina Dunich. And it was compared to Mavis Gallant, which got my attention. It is about the essential solitude of our moment. One of the main characters is a trumpet player, so there is the trumpet on the cover. And that's all I need to know about it going in. So I'm excited to give this a try. Well, I hope to finish a whole bunch of books by the time I check in my last Friday Reads of the Year. Next Friday, you know, there's there's a lot of holidays. What are they called again? Oh, yeah, Chris, Christmas holidays are coming up very soon. So I'll, I'll be a little bit busy, but not really. So I'm hoping to finish a whole slew of books because I am planning to hit the ground running in January with, like, umpteen buddy reads and stuff. So as, as many books as I can finish without rushing through them... That is my intention, and I may not finish any of them, but my my current reads is now down to 36, down from 44. So I've, I've made some progress, and I hope to make even more. It would be lovely to finish another six books, for example, and because I'll probably be adding five or six the first week of January. So that's what you have to look forward to on my next Friday reads. Let's see how well I did. And yes, happy holidays if you're into that sort of thing. Thanks for watching.